very important people in the world and they need to know how to lead a country. Um, Bas in 1985 was focusing a little bit more on organizations. That was the first time when transformational leadership came into organizations. Actually, we started with the four components, uh, which would be the next slide, um, um, Sebastian, is individualized consideration, the intellectual stimulation, uh, the motivation is a very high part, and of course, the idealized influence. But more important than this are actually the five principles of transformational leadership, which is uh, self-esteem, uh, planning, motivation, delegation, and empowerment. There are also, you find in the, in the internet also seven or eight principles, but we talk about the five key in, uh, principles. However, the most important principles is not even listed here, which should be, but it's communication. It's all about communication. Each of these components are positively related to individual and organizational performance, of course. But then in 2006, John Cotto really focused on leading and change management. And uh, he has a bestseller, it calls the Penguin Principles. Mm -hmm. And Cotter is using a fable to develop uh, the eight stages of change. And the Penguin, because Fred is living in the Antarctica and one day he discovers that these people are in great danger and urgent changes are pending. Changes are connected with risk. We have to consider this. But he also identified errors in change, such as for example, um, people do not see a reason for a change or they do underestimating the power of vision, meaning not letting people know what you're trying to change. Under communicating the vision, communication needs to capture hearts and minds. And then we come on the later stage to the difference between transformational leadership in Western Europe and Eastern European countries. And this is a main topic, it needs to capture hearts and minds because we talk about different cultures, emotions, egos in, within an organization. And this is slightly different in Central Eastern European country or in Western Europe. Not mention what is better. There is not better or worse, but it is definitely different. Um, transformational leadership, ladies and gentlemen, changes aren't easily and normally encounters bloggers. Failing to create short-term wins we need to see some quick results along the journey. Company like Rational, it take, took us two years to finally implement the transformational legal process. But you need to show people after three months, six months, a continuously grow of the goals to keep them in the boat and move forward with you in the strategy of the company. Um, did something change? You were too fast a little bit, but doesn't matter. Um, yes, uh, of course, a lot of things has been changed in the transformational leadership style. Um, it inspires employees to strive beyond required expectations to work toward a shared vision. And that transformational, leader, uh, transformational leaders focus on transforming others to support each other and the organization as a whole. We're not talking anymore like in 20 years ago, we have the authority leadership style or the cooperative leadership style, this is old fashioned, this is past. Well, probably in some family organizations, it's still running the ball like this, but not in a modern organization, okay? And then followers of a transformational leader respond by feeling trust, admiration, loyalty, and respect for the leader and are more willing to work harder than originally expected. That would be the next slide. Sebastian? Okay. But you can, you can, um, you can keep this. Um, so these, these are four keywords which you have to address to your followers. And uh, as I said before, it's, it's not easy to, to align with all your employers that everybody is on the same page, but it is necessary and uh, when we come to the next slide uh, and talk, start talking about implementation is key, I can tell you 70% um, of transformational leadership fails. And that's a huge amount of percentage, 70% fails. Change is good, of course, 
but first you have to ask yourself or knowing your operation or organization that good, do we really need a change? And if you say yes, meaning from the top management board level down to the line management, to the coworkers, the entire organization must be part of it. Yes, it does cost money. Um, it's time consuming. Depends on the size of the organization. It will take up to between 18 and 24 months. And as I mentioned before, the executive board members, they set up the strategy mainly with the HR department. The CEO is the head of a transformational leadership implementation process into the entire organization. You must engage all managers, all employees um, on different processes or different units. Employees must have full transparency and are actively involved in the process. What means actively? Um, you have to set up uh, ongoing workshops taking place in order to implement the strategy in all areas. You have to teach them, you have to, you have to guide them. It, it, it is a difficult, long process and you need breath and patience. All management managers need to get trained as well in different modules. Uh, like appraisals, coaching, mentoring, leading, and especially in communication. Um, and when we talk about, for example, I mentioned this quite before a little bit, uh, the, the implementation in key in, in Central European countries is different. Besides the usual key implementation process, you must understand cultural differences. This is an additional challenge you must consider. And at the end of the day, you work and deal with human beings. And that's why on this slide, these three or four topics like serving leadership, inspiration, motivation, guidance, communication, this is the key. And uh, there, those are strong words. And behind every strong words, there's a lot of going down when you put it down on details. So really it's time consuming and a, a difficult process to implement. Um, transformational leadership now in the time of crisis is of course also a topic. Um, during a crisis situation, it is important for leaders to provide the necessary guidance, even more than a, than a normal daily business day. Uh, it needs inspiration and motivation for followers, members uh, of an organization. Transformational leadership, if successfully in a clear guidance, can lead the organization towards to a much better future. But still consider 70% fails. You deal with human beings, you deal with emotions, with egos, followers, and blockers. And every one of those ones needs to be a part of it. Thank you very much. And let's go also to uh, Rike. Rike, are you here? Uh, I have to. Okay. Okay. okay I think now it works. Can you hear me all? Yes. Very good. All right, so thanks a lot for the platform. So I'm introducing myself uh, quickly and then I will move a little bit to the company I'm working for uh, and then uh, into the topics actually. So my name is Rika. I am the, <clears throat> sorry, I'm the HR director for Dach and Nordic. So it's pretty much central European region for a company called Racket Bank Giza. I'm working since uh, almost my first day. I work in HR and I have a passion for HR because I can impact the environment where people work and um, help that everyone loves to come to work every day. So that is my, my motto and this is what I would like to achieve. So to tell you a little bit where I'm coming from actually and uh, where my experience is based on. So I'm coming a little bit from you know, my experience base and a practical approach of leadership. So I work at this company called RB, Racket Bankiza. The Bankiza part is the German part. We are very, very local here in Southern, Europe, in Southern Germany. 
and we are selling consumer good products. And you probably know a couple of our brands. We are selling them in almost every country in the world. We have uh, over 40,000 employees, uh, not in Dach and Nordics where I work, but globally, obviously, we are very diverse, a very dynamic, very fast paced company. And um, I work in an environment where I have a lot of, you know, commercial people around me. So um, they all have a, a minimum, a bachelor's degree in economics or something like that. So that is a little bit the background and the environment I'm coming from. And if you move to the next slide, I also want to share with you our purpose. So why are we selling these kind of products? Because that is then becoming a little bit more important later on. So our purpose is basically to protect, heal, and nurture in the relentless pursuit of a clean and healthier world. And we really want to give access to hygiene products and health products to everyone and not make it a privilege, but make it a right for everyone. And this obviously applies not so much to our markets where I'm working in, but in a lot of other markets. And that bigger purpose, that bigger kind of um, direction and vision is something um, which is helpful if you know if you want to bring employees also behind you because you have basically you know you're not selling just um, I don't know a little bit of uh, Dettol or Sacrotan but you really actually fulfill a bigger purpose which is uh, very important also for the younger generation coming in but enough also about RB and where I come from so I would like to actually today talk a little bit uh, about leadership about leadership in times of changes and uh, what my experiences basically were. So leadership challenges, and we just had a bigger challenge, right? So we had in the last month, uh, quite a big challenge because everything changed. So we all work from home. We're actually still working from home. That's why uh, you also see not a big, a nice office background. So this is actually my uh, new office uh, back home. So, and I experienced a little bit uh, what does it actually mean to go through these challenges with a full organization? And for me, it was uh, very difficult to not get, you know, the pulse of the people. So I couldn't talk to people. I didn't get their feedback. I didn't know, uh, or I still don't, like, how, how do they feel? And I thought, okay, this is quite interesting. And it's a bit, it's a bit difficult. Um, and then I thought, okay, what is actually culture uh, doing um, to this? Or what is how important is culture uh, in terms of or in times of change or challenges and that was one realization and I just wanted to share that thought with you guys that I think the culture you have in an organization is super important and is also carrying you through difficult times. So moving on and I had another webinar and uh, together with Culture M which is a partner of Steiner Partner as well and uh, I really liked the phrase um, DGR CEO um, said, and he said that if you don't deliver on your culture in a crisis, then your culture meant nothing to start with. And when you stand successful on the other side, your culture will be why. That basically means that, especially in times of change and especially in times of challenges, it is super important that you still live your culture and that you still really try um, to ask for feedback, to um, make sure that you live your behaviors, you announce your, your values of the company, that you really display all of that during times of changes um, or challenges as well. And I put a little icon here because um, we gave a lot of freedom and we form culture basically every day in our company and our uh, trainees, our graduates, they formed a platform and they basically carried us through um, these uncertain times and they made us connect to each other. So it was not HR driven, it was not leadership driven, but our people, they created a platform. So three times a week, we connect to each other and we see talents of our people presented in those connects uh, during lunchtime. People are singing for us, people are um, meditating with us, people are playing an instrument or um, you know, sharing their experience and their career. So this is something um, very much culture building and this is something which came from the organization. So one point I think in times of changes is really culture and continue living on your culture. Because what we tend to do is that if you're going to change process or if we are going to 
a, a tough time, we tend to, you know, direct our people. We tend to say, look, this is how we, what we need to do. Um, I know it better. I'm the leader. Uh, let's go uh, and, and do this. And this is also building on what Ron said just before. I believe, especially in challenging times, especially in, in, ch in changes, you know, organizational changes, setups, it is super important to listen. To listen to your people, to listen to understand, and to actively ask for feedback. There, for example, you know, great surveys you can do, or what we are currently doing when you don't feel the pulse, because everyone is working from home, you can ask people. Because sometimes we tend as leaders to, to think that we need to know everything. But actually, why do we give our people feedback? We give them feedback so that they can develop, that they can learn, that they can perform better. The same applies to us as leaders, right? As a management team, we can also learn from what our people have to say. So I truly believe that um, a leadership quality is continuously to listen and not to be afraid to ask for feedback and see where the organization stands to actually help doing the right thing and help improving how people are feeling so that you can actually do what they are, what they need. So culture is super important and feedback and listening, I think is super important during times of change. Because, and I like this quote, command oriented, low freedom management is common because it is profitable, means that you, of course, if someone is maybe not following the change um, very quickly, you can also replace that someone is may be easier but then again are you really achieving what you wanted to achieve because you need at some point to bring the full organization with you and a lot of managers are maybe even terrified to ask for feedback to really listen to the organization but i truly believe you know in order to give accountability you need to also show that and demonstrate that here so but what is um uh, what is actually um, engaging, motivating, inspiring. So this is also building on what Ron said before. So how do you do that? And what is that? And how do you, what, what, what do managers actually have to do in order to, you know, engage through a change process or motivate or inspire in a crisis? And I want to go a little bit back and see how, you know, leadership and management actually evolved over the time of the last uh, years, basically. So if we talk about management 1.0, I just called it like this. So it's basically a little bit of a technical approach, right? It was, um, you know, if, if people were basically treated like, you know, parts in a, in a, in a factory. And then we came to management 2.0, which I think is already, it sounds super nice. In a management 2.0 organization, everyone recognizes that people are the most valuable assets. And we know that we hear that a lot. People are the, the most important asset in a company, although we're actually not really treating them this way. But it's a good, very, very important approach because that's actually how it is. And then we also say, look, we need to become servant leaders. And I'm a fan of this approach. I think leaders need to serve the organization. But still then, you know, in that kind of uh, phase, we're still in a, a management 2.0 kind of phase. Um, managers still like the hierarchy and uh, still know where they are, where the organization needs to go to. And I believe that, you know, organizations, and I see this in my environment, and uh, some organizations are already very advanced. Uh, some, maybe this approach is not really applic applicable yet, at least. Um, is a bit more an agile kind of leadership approach. So some people might see an organization, let's say like a city, like a town where everyone basically knows, okay, this is where, how we want to live. This is the direction we want to go. And uh, as long as this is clear, you can give a lot of accountability to people because you know that they are doing the right thing. And then you actually need less leaders. And I really, this uh, approach intrigues me a bit because I believe that the world is getting so complex that you cannot direct everything anymore. You need to give more accountability to people. And basically everyone in the organization is then also a leader. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are managing um, other people. So basically this approach of a more agile leadership says that 
And the job of a management is then to design and run the system that supports the company in achieving its purpose. So basically leaders are then kind of guarding us, you know, so they guard in the system, but they don't need to direct every single person because if the purpose and the vision is clear, then, you know, you need to somehow guard in the system, but the people will do and work into the right direction. And this is giving a lot of accountability. And I also believe that, especially in the environment, for example, where I work, we have a lot of smart people, a lot of creative people, that actually some of them don't yet realize, but most of them do, that um, if you go to the next slide, we have it here, yes, that um, they don't realize they are also responsible for management stuff. No, it's not just the managers who manage or lead. Management is too important to leave it only to the managers. It belongs to everyone. And that might be a little bit of a strange approach to some of, uh, some of you or some of us, but I think there's a tendency that organizations are developing into that direction. But then we have the question, obviously, and I will go through this uh, quite fast and not into every detail, is so what is, and then actually leadership, if, um, you know, if we are only gardeners, basically. It's about energizing people, and this goes back to what Ron has also said. It's about empowering teams. It's about, you know, enabling self-organization, removing roadblocks. It's about developing competence and skills within the organization. It's around growing structure, and this is already on the next slide, and it's around improving basically everything. And here I think a little bit differently because I believe that we are constantly changing, that we are constantly evolving, and that a big part of a leadership role is that you basically constantly improve and constantly change. That doesn't mean that we go through a reorganization every two minutes, but I think that a couple that every year we somehow adapt to our consumers, to the change which is happening outside of us. And therefore, this is a very big leadership ask. So of course, um, this is easier said than it is done. Um, and that for me means also, and this is why I'm here, I guess, because I come a little bit from the HR angle, from the people and culture angle, is that also the role of HR is changing. And I hear that from Stein and Partner as well through their experiences in the market. So probably some of you, and we hear it very shortly in the panel discussion, I'm very excited to hear that, is that probably the role uh, HR had um, at early, in earlier times is probably a little bit different. So obviously we still need to do payroll. I mean, you can outsource this, you still need to do contracts. But it's quite, different. So it's quite hard what HR nowadays also needs to, um, or the expectation basically is, and it's not so easy to find. I see that also when I recruit HR people. So basically, and I put here our, you know, um, HR competencies just as an example. So I think commercial acumen is super important for the role of HR leaders. You need to understand the business. You need to know what everyone is talking about. You need to support also decisions or get involved yourself. Then listening and asking questions, challenging, so basically coaching leaders is a very important role. And it's a very different competency um, compared to, you know, uh, you know, all the administrative work, which uh, also needs to be done or has been done in HR. I think you need a lot of courage. For example, you, know, you need to stand up or take unpopular stands. Uh, you need to, um, you know, you need to also maybe have a different opinion or challenge or give feedback, which might not always be um, just positive. And connection, for example, connecting, bringing people together to achieve a common goal, bringing everyone behind you and communication. And this is also what you said, Ron, communication is key. And this is also key if we talk about, you know, creating a movement, which is the last bucket. It's basically, um, you know, understanding the behaviors or stages of change, um, uniting people around a common purpose and storytelling. So how do I bring across the message in the organization? How do I inspire people behind a certain cause or a certain change in the organization? So what I wanted to elaborate on is that 
with all the changes we face in leadership and um, the challenges we face in the business, this is also impacting the role of HR and making it a little bit different than we have seen it uh, in the past, let's say 20, 30 years. But now I'm super curious to hear about the experiences of um, those people who are leading businesses or have led businesses in Eastern and Western Europe. So I myself have experienced, I worked in, uh, in Eastern Europe, I, I worked in the Netherlands and I've lived in Australia, Italy. But now this, what I was sharing is from my experience basically working in Central Europe. So now I'm very curious to hear how this, uh, how this is going and I hand over to Dan. Thanks a lot for the time. Thank you so much, Rike, for the, for the great input. It's uh, always very valuable. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, I will now hand over the word uh, uh, to you so that you can uh, guide us uh, through the round table. Uh, as Rike already said, we are very curious to find out uh, how uh, transformational leadership do, does actually look like and work in Eastern Europe. Well, thank you very much for that, Sebastian. And also, thank you a lot, Ron, and also Rike, of course, for your, for your great insights and you know, personal beliefs and your experiences and everything what you extract out of that. I would like to maybe hook in at one point in the slide from Rike where she said, uh, all of this is actually easier said than it is done. So keeping this in mind, maybe let's jump directly to three very, very experienced business leaders with a lot of uh, experience in the back, specifically in the Central Eastern European region, but not only. And um, maybe for a start, I would like to jump directly to Marcos. Marcos, are you with me? Do you hear me? Can you speak? Yes. C can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, Marcos. Okay. Hello. Good to hear you. So, Marcos, considering, you know, especially what also Rika mentioned in terms of the change, um, transformation processes, and the impact of organizational culture and employee behavior and transformational processes. You have a huge experience in CEE. You have been over a decade in Romania only in several management positions. What is your point of view? What do you take out of that? Okay, F first of all, um, hello to everybody who is listening to me. And uh, everything that was told by Rike and by Ron this is exactly what I would like to talk about, but in practice. So for me, I would say, let's talk about leadership in change management. This is what I had to apply uh, very often, frequently during my uh, years, particularly in, uh, in Romania with Holcim and with uh, also Amaropa Grains. <clears throat> if you want to have a change, you have to be aware that there is the employee behavior and the culture of the organization. So the employee behavior is uh, for sure is influenced by the culture of the organization, but the employee is also influenced by the technology that he has or she has to apply, by evaluation they receive, assessment also, the processes the, the organization applies, the tools that are available, and there are people with skills, with more or less skills. So. First of all, we have to reshape the organization's culture because the employee is influenced by the culture. And in order to manage the changes, was also told by Rike particularly, we have to communicate. <clears throat> we have to ask first questions to us. Do enough people understand what we want to have? The sense of emergency, we need to do better. So we have to bring it over. We this, that means the, the, the leader. Hmm? And whose support do we need? And what vision and how to get there and how to communicate what obstacles can be faced and how to make the change part of the culture. So you see that the change of the, of, of the organization means to change the culture or to influence the culture and this then influences the employees <clears throat> and where are the lucky wins and how to achieve them this is also important that we talk about this that we communicate so what do I want to tell I have a vision I have a message 
and I have to bring this over to the employees. Normally this is to improve the efficiency uh, and this generates then also resources that we can use in, uh, in, in, in other fields. And also what is very important, our staff also have to have fun. And we also have to, sometimes we have to laugh and we have to have a good time. And this is very important because satisfied people also bring uh, good uh, results. And if they are unhappy, also the result at the end might be unhappy. And the processes in change uh, management, the processes have to be fair. Well, I know this is very easy to talk about fairness now sitting at the table. And uh, the but the employee has at the end has to be satisfied with the outcome in which direction this goes for the employee. <clears throat> and the employees have to buy in and they have in order to be satisfied or to find the satisfaction in these changes. And the employee, this is also the task of the uh, uh, of the leader has to 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 bring the uh, employee to, that, that he is uh, or she is willing to accept also negative outcome and then at the end it should perform these changes <clears throat> so, but now i i would also like to go to see we, we have talked about managing and 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 leader for me uh, it is called transformational uh, leadership. Now, for me, I would say this is leadership. I make the distinguishing between leadership and between management. So a manager is leading the company or is managing the company uh, through figures. So we have a, a product, a sales product, and we have a profit. This, this has to, to be improved that this is a manager, but a leader uh, needs uh, many other uh, attributes, as it was told by my uh, two uh, colleagues uh, speaking before. And here we had applied the leadership competency model. For each leader, and the leader can be a first line leader, can be a middle management leader, or can be a top management leader. And then the the points to to watch and to follow might differ differ from one level to the other so the first very important point in my opinion is the thinking the business that means the leader has to understand the business and he has i'm always telling he but it's also the she included here you know to apply the knowledge effectively and to set the directions and also what I was always telling my people, this is that there should be a financial benefit. So I do not go into the direction that we do business, but at the end we do not need to have a profit. No, I was always talking about also to have a profit and people have understood this, I think. <clears throat> and the leader has to make strong decisions and particularly in uh, complex situations. So this is to think the business. And then to energize, this is the, the, the second uh, area where the leader has uh, to, 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 to be uh, very skilled. This is to energize people or to inspire people, to motivate people and also to develop people, to communicate uh, with they, them and they, this should foster an openness so we have to communicate very openly and what what i have seen particularly in uh, in eastern europe is that the development of people this was in many cases this was new for them i mean to to to, to give them the possibility that they can uh, visit, uh, participate in a, in, in a training, in a very simple training might be, but not only to pay a higher salary, but also to develop people and to show them where in which direction they might go in the organization. And then what I also consider very important, this is the, that the, the leader has to act as a role model. <clears throat> that means uh, we have as a role model we can influence uh, our people 
And this is also the nonverbal communication. The personal commitment and courage to, in, uh, to, to inspire trust and confidence by handling the situations with compassion and hon honesty. This is extremely important that we have to, the leader has to be honest and that we are accepting feedback and that we are also accepting new challenges. Might be there is a new challenge for me as a leader that is, <clears throat> that is very unknown to me, but then maybe other people, some of my subordinates, they even know better how to do this, but then let them participate and be open and uh, show them that you have trust into them. And th then you get an excellent result, particularly of the specialists. Thank you very much, Marcus, for that. I need to interrupt you at this point. I'm very, very sorry. I would love to listen further to your, to your outcomes. No. However, we need to stick a little bit to the time. Maybe last two sentences from your side, Marcus, regarding this. Okay, okay, okay. Go, 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 yes. Okay, so let's move on. Um, Peter, if it is okay, I would like to continue with you. You are, at this point in time, CEO of Heidi Chocolate in Romania, but also you have had several other leadership positions in CE, but not only in CE. And uh, I'm quite curious, and I believe our audience is very curious too. Um, what do you believe actually leaders today can improve when looking around, when, when thinking about the outcome and, and the realization of a change or transformation process, maybe specifically also to Central and Eastern Europe? Thank you, Dan, and good evening, everybody. Um, so first of all, let me start with the bad news. There is no formula. There's no formula because leadership or transformational leadership, but leadership in general is uh, dealing with people. And people are individuals and every individual is different. So there's no formula. That's the bad news. But what I believe what is important to understand is why do people follow people or follow leaders? And I think there are two key critical things. And that's, uh, I think, valid uh, across all the countries I was working. First, it's about trust. People follow leaders they trust. That means people feel sure when they're listened, treated fair, honest, empowered, and believed in. All that was said, but this is building trust. The second is competence. Let's put it that way. Rarely people follow idiots. Sometimes it happens, but it's very rare. So I think leaders need to believe that they know what they're doing and that they have the critical skills. I believe competence builds confidence. And you can say trust, competence, confidence, that's a kind of a triangle. Yeah? But also to be clear, and it was also said, it does not mean a leader needs to know everything. He's not the expert of everything. He does not know everything. That would be even wrong, that would lead to uh, micromanagement, which is absolutely too wrong. It's about empowerment. And Rike talked also about the HL organization, a self-learning organization given freedom. Um, uh, Marcus was talking about fun. Fun is also you're doing good what you love to do. Yeah. So it's important to give this kind of entertainment, if you want, that people enjoy really what they want. And people need to like, like to go uh, to the job. So now coming concrete to your, uh, your question, Dan, uh, what, what could help uh, to Im improve? It's, it's very simple. It was partly said. I mean, first of all, change is for the most people tough. It's not an easy exercise. So creating this kind of sense of urgency, making people understanding why to change and why is it better for them as individual, for the organization and for the community. Yeah? I think that's very critical. So it's not about building fear but it's a clear understanding of the seriousness of the issue of the situation and what are the consequences if you're not changing. It's understanding, as they call it, the point of departure. The next point is to define the point of arrival. So where do you want to go? What is the big picture plan? You can also call it what is the vision? What needs to change and how we will make it happen? Yeah. And you can only do that, that's the third point, with a coalition, building a team around you, which is supporting and working together 
on the solution, but also on the implementation. As it was said before, implementation is obviously key critical. Yeah? Strategy is as good as the execution. <laughs> and when we talk about a powerful coalition, then I mean, on the one side, you need to engage with the stakeholders. Very often in bigger companies, it's important. You might have a great idea and, and the team is, is, is really buying in, but the owner of the company or the board of directors, whoever is the stakeholder on the other side, um, might be not buying in or might, not, uh, might see it differently. So that's the one thing, and then also to secure uh, that you align with the stakeholders and to build a coalition with the stakeholders, and then the team, your team, and the people which implement them. And it's very critical in a transformation, very often uh, you have, you're working with people that will sustain in an organization, but more important also very often, not everybody in an organization uh, will continue. So I give you an example, when you do an integration of two big companies, uh, obviously one plus one is not two. I mean, you will look for efficiency and effectiveness, effectiveness increase in the organization. So key critical is to give people perspective and to talk honest to them. Yeah? I mean, to tell people what they can expect in which direction the journey are going. And that's not easy. That's for managers, for leaders, not easy because it's sometimes tough messages you have to pass. But it will build the credibility as a leader because you treat people fair and honest. And even when people might be not happy with the message you're passing, but they accept and they will understand that you are treating them in a fair and honest way and as a good individual. And then it was said communication. Then you need, when you have your team built, uh, which is really executing. Uh, I give you an example. I mean, we had a, a merger of a, a company was 12,000 people. We found a, a new global company. It was in the coffee business and there were around 12,000 people. And you can say this coalition team does not need more than 100 people, 80 to 100 people can give a wave to the next level and, 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 and beyond to influence, to build, as Marcus was saying, the culture needed, uh, which is really pulling the people. So, and then you need to communicate it. That's the point for communication to the organization. And then the fifth point is to deliver also quick wins. Yeah? And if there are obstacles, leaders have to remove them. That's the job of leaders to remove obstacles. We have to take uh, we have to give energy to the organization and we have to take stress out of an organization. Yeah? And then you continuously communicate. I call it, you communicate with boring penetrance. And the best is when people saying, we know already what he wants to say, then it starts sticking in an organization. And as big an organization is, as more often you have to repeat it. We feel sometimes we list ourselves a little bit Bullish, I mean, we put repeating and repeating and repeating. But as big an organization is, as more important is to repeat that everybody really understands that you build uh, the culture. And at the end of the day, a transformation in leader is a transformation in leader when the organization continues with the culture when the transformation in leader is leaving. Thank you very much for that, uh, Peter. It will definitely stick to me and also to the audience, I believe. Thank you very much for the insights. Maybe uh, let's jump quickly forward to Frank at this point. Frank, do you hear us? Can you, can you speak? Yes, I can hear you now. If you can hear me as well. Excellent. Yes, very well. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, particularly uh, regarding you, Frank, uh, you have been for very many years CEO of E.ON in Romania. And I mean, it is, it is not a big secret. The turnaround of E.ON in Romania is considered to be a very renowned and very, very successful process, a transformation process in the end, involving a lot of change. And I think the audience and, and I, of course, we are very happy having you here with us because we would like to understand better what this meant also precisely in terms of Eon Romania. So, so maybe Frank, uh, could you maybe just dive a little bit into very shortly, what did it mean when you get in, what happened? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. So thank you very much. Yes. And uh, well, my name is Frank. I'm since 15 years or so 16 years now in Romania. I came right after the privatization started, meaning after signing, but before closing of the transaction. So I was uh, part of the whole transformation since privatization of the E.ON group, which was a former Distigas Nord, 
the gas distribution company and uh, uh, for the northern part of Romania and Electrica Moldova at that point in time, which was the uh, northeastern electricity provider. Uh, I would characterize the transformation of this 15 years really as a permanent change. There were permanent changes going on in the organization, stressing the organization, stressing the people, to be honest. And um, these 15 years can be clustered roughly in three different phases, I would say. The first phase, um, they were not really distinctive, but with different focus, let's say. First phase was right after privatization was really <clears throat> to uh, take over two former state-owned companies uh, and also with management principles and styles as we can, or at least as we could find them in, in state-owned companies at that point in time. And uh, main task was really here to go through an uh, organizational change and transformation, which integrated the company into the E.ON group, into, let's say, more modern uh, management standards, into reporting systems, having completely new systems developed, et cetera, et cetera. So, <clears throat> and, uh, all, in all these 15 years, but uh, also in the first five years, if you take this first phase, communication uh, was key really for the success of the implementation. And we, we had quite a big challenge in front of us. And also, as Peter said, um, it was a phase which was tough for the employees, but it required a lot of openness, fairness, and honesty towards the people. I mean, we were downsizing an organization at that point in time from 12 and a half thousand employees to 6,000 employees. Um, stakeholder management was absolutely key also to, and it's not only the shareholders, but we're talking here about unions, we're talking about state shareholders. Um, so people with totally different interests than, let's say, private uh, uh, shareholders in the company, which all had to be aligned. And honestly, I'm very proud that this phase was really very successful. You will not find anything negative about E.ON in the, in the media about this, with a downsizing of almost 50%. And uh, um, also, really, it was very, very key to build the right team around you, to have them support you and uh, really to run the organization in a new way. But that, let's say that was the bread and butter business in the beginning of the organization. You take over a new organization, which was also run in different management styles, let's say. Second phase was then uh, really to strive per for, for performance. <clears throat> and whereas such big reorganizations as we had in front of us in the beginning are very much, very often top-down driven, if you want to go really for performance in the organization, then uh, you need the input from the people. You need to understand where are the real problems in the organization, what is stopping us. And uh, we started then with implementing some new models like lean organization, uh, lean management models. You may know this, for example, from the car industry, from Toyota. Toyota are leading with it. And, we, uh, and it involves a lot of really getting the team, the people, up to the field worker involved to look for performance in the organization. What is going wrong? And these are very small things sometimes, uh, which lead to very big effects also. And it goes all up uh, uh, in the hierarchy, or let's say in the, in the, uh, on all levels of the organization, in order to uh, uh, really uh, uh, harvest uh, all the uh, potential benefits for the company, its shareholders, and its employees at the end of the day. Uh, so that was the first attempt also of really heavily involving then the employees in the development uh, of the organization, smaller and bigger things. And what were the obstacles? Um, honestly, very often the obstacles are in the middle management um, because very often the people uh, or the middle managers, not only middle, middle managers, also happens a lot with top managers, and I'll come to that also in a second, but their, their employees, their team members, I ask what to improve. The common understanding is the manager knows it best, especially in hierarchical organizations, or let's say in Romania, uh, I think it's fair to say that it's a very hierarchically driven country. And uh, therefore it requires a lot of self-confidence also of the middle managers to let go, yeah, to really involve the people. And uh, honestly, the, the, the field workers, they 
were first of all also reluctant to take this new empowerment, let's say, to bring in new ideas and to see that something is happening also, it's also very important. Um, because they were used to a different management style, a management style which was law and order. You know? So do what you have to do and uh, that's it and don't ask questions, uh, we know it better anyway. This style does not work in any modern organization or not very well. So a lot of potential gets lost then. Mm, so with this lean teams, lean organization, lean working principles, that was really a first attempt uh, or, or really an attempt which was successful to involve the organization, to look for performance, to bring the performance, and also not only the performance of the company, really also the, let's say, the, the work satisfaction for the employees forward, because they see that they are here, they see that they can bring in their ideas, and that something is really changing, which is also really very important, that you don't just uh, pick up ideas and they get lost in the organization. Um, so let's say I give you just one example of this second period, which I would call strive for performance and outperformance. And we were really one of the best performing distribution companies in the E.ON group at that point in time. The last phase I would characterize, well, if you look at the ping penguin model, which Ron also mentioned, was um, guys, we have a problem and we have to look for something new. Uh, let's look for new shores. And it was about creating a sense of urgency. Um, energy is traditionally political business. It is also a business uh, where we did not have a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. So in the past, it was a monopole, in, at least on a regional level. And, uh, but with the liberalization of the market and also different needs and wishes of, from our customers, um, it was very important that we really change the organization and the, the, the behavior of our employees and the management style radically. What do I mean with that? So um, we needed, because new competition was coming up with the liberalization of the market, we needed really a, a real customer orientation. And also we needed to look for really new products and services for our customers. Why do, uh, am I convinced and was I convinced at that point in time, I'm very sure that it was really right also, why did we need to look for new products and services? The gas and electricity is not sexy. Uh, everybody expected to come out of the plug and out of the pipeline. Um, it just has to be there. And honestly, it also has just to be there. So it's very important, but it does, it also means that you're very, very easily replaceable. It's, it's difficult to change your your phone to change from an iPhone to an Android phone you know? and you also have uh, it's something you have to hold in your hand that's not the same for gas and electricity so here you're really very very easy replaceable and you could see this also that new competitors were coming up and they are still coming up um, taking our customers and there will always be somebody who can can offer electricity or gas one or two ron or cents cheaper than you can so therefore, <clears throat> it was very important to, to build a, a foundation, a basis to really lock in the customers, yeah? to, have, to make them feel that they are, let's say, specially treated, that they are um, really uh, also get more than just electricity and gas from your electricity and gas provider. And we started then to uh, build products and service around gas and electricity, which would let's say, help to lock in the customers and to offer them really something in, in addition. And we were very, very successful. And how did we do that? Um, I'd like to pick up some other uh, things which were mentioned earlier. So we implemented... Right, excuse me very shortly. I, I really need to ask you to wrap it up quickly. So what we did... Two more sentences, please. Sure. So what we did, we implemented agile principles for the development of new products and services, which means we built really self-empowered teams, another big change in management uh, um, culture, uh, who developed new products and services extremely successful. Teams uh, coming with uh, team members coming from different, uh, dis uh, with different backgrounds and uh, locked them into a room and they had the task then to really develop within three, four months a new product for the market. And uh, I have to round it up. Unfortunately, I can talk, I can talk about this for another hour. But it was in some areas very, very successful. Um, and it gave also the organization and the team members extreme satisfaction, work satisfaction, to be able to develop something from scratch on their own 
uh, and uh, to implement it then also. And uh, I'm really proud to say that we uh, became then market leader within one and a half years with some very important products in the heating area, uh, which really made a turnaround also in the organization. Uh, and um, that was really a very, very important step forward. Unfortunately, I have to stop now. Sorry. Well, thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. And uh, we all know about the, the success story of E.ON and, and the entire 15 years that you have spent with E.ON. I think it was really uh, quite a, an interesting and rough ride in times. Uh, maybe let us address uh, all together shortly a question that actually Elike raised. Uh, also answering her curiosity, but not only. In what respect did actually the role of HR change recently? Maybe also thinking about transformational organization, transformational processes and change, but also in general from your expertise. This time really, gentlemen, please only very short, the top three points that come up to your mind. Maybe let's start with Marcos. Marcos, are you with us? Yes, I'm still here. So HR, how is it today differently to how was it earlier or how should it be? Well, I, I, I would say uh, after uh, we, we heard now from Frank and uh, Peter, I can uh, completely agree to this. I, I just would like to add one point here that applies particularly in, uh, in Eastern Europe. If I, I made several times, I was also in Serbia, the experience that I wanted to discuss something with two people, two management people also. And in one case, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the recipe of raw materials to, to produce uh, cement. And there was no, no real exchange of opinion, you know. But at the end, I had to take the decision. And then it started <clears throat> that people uh, had a lot of, uh, of, of uh, points against this uh, this uh, decision they that they always came up with a, a lot of problems that they see and i could finalize this by telling them this is great that you can see the problem that you can analyze it and that you can tell about this problem do this also in the future but whenever you see a problem you come with the problem yes but then you come with one two three proposals of how to improve such situations and this is at the end to hand over responsibility to the people and this is to energize people and this is something that was uh, not uh, very uh, very common in uh, eastern europe i think today it's it's much better however there's still potential in order to uh, to, to, to empower these people and to, to energize people and then the company has uh, has the possibility to get a lot out of these people, if you do not tell them that you you are responsible also, and you you may even uh, do once a mistake, this is accepted in the the, the former uh, the, the former management uh, uh, culture in uh, Romania. I, I experienced this. This was not allowed. So people just went down on the water level, just that no one can cut their heads, but then the organization did not re get out what they could have uh, received from uh, the experience of these people. So this is a message to this. Thank you very much for that. Maybe only very shortly, Marcus, coming back to my question and maybe also addressing Rike's question, actually. From your point of view, very, very shortly, two, three bullet points, what do you actually believe has changed in the role of HR nowadays? Also, maybe in terms of transformational leadership and supporting such change processes. This question to me, yes? Yes, Marcos, if you would be so kind. Thank you so much. Yes. <clears throat> okay, I, I, I think that uh, we, the investors or the investors in, uh, in, in uh, the Eastern European countries, they have to, to be aware that they invest into people. That, that, that means, as I was already telling, that we develop these people and that we communicate with, uh, with the people. And this you, during my uh, 12, 14 years of experience only in Romania, I, I could see that there was a, a, a very big step forward uh, performed and uh, I, I had excellent people, but we, 
the investors we have to invest into people and not only into uh, in, into the manufacturing uh, units and into into factories and this has changed uh, a lot and today if i see people running the companies also what, what has changed today is that in many companies they are not uh, expats uh, as leaders of the companies and even as, as ceos of the companies but in many cases they are local people uh, leading the, the the companies and being the, the the ceos the managing directors of the companies and i think this is a this is a good uh, uh, development of uh, of people and this also has to do with the the, the hr uh, culture that uh, prevails in, in the organizations thank you very much michael yeah. Uh, Peter, I would like to force the question to you, maybe shortly, your thoughts. Did HR change? Should it change? How is it? Um, the change in HR, how I see it over the years, is changing from a functional expertise in a business sparring partner. Yeah, I, I think this is the development uh, that HR is much broader, more involved in business processes and, uh, and, and understanding process and really driving and driving the agenda of, of, of change and transformation, being a sparring partner uh, for the executives. And then when we are talking in, in particular on Eastern European countries or post-communistic countries, and then obviously HI had a very specific role in some of these emerging countries, keeping people aligned yeah, to a certain parole. Yeah? And uh, obviously we are always perceived from people a little bit as a kind of uh, internal police, if, if I may say so. Yeah? Uh, that was clearly also politically driven by the systems, and, and this is still maybe in, in, in some older generations in, in, in their mind when they think about HR. But in general, the move from functional expertise to business partner, uh, which I really appreciate, and that's helping a lot, uh, being a great sparring partner. So that to you, Rike. And maybe last, Frank, would you also give your thoughts to this question? Yeah, I think Peter summarized it very well. I mean, when I came to Romania, HR was basically hiring and firing people, doing the formal stuff and paying out the salaries. Um, this is not what you expect from a modern HR function right now. Uh, so um, I always had an HR board member also, uh, because uh, for if you make, if you come to big business decisions, which like, like going into new fields, yeah, and you look maybe for totally different capabilities and you look for totally different uh, managers, for certain functions than they were used to. That has to really also be, uh, let's say, seen by HR and supported by HR. And, um, um, and HR is actually in a very difficult role. So on one hand side, they are the watchdog. No? Rico also mentioned it. So you have to make sure, I mean, everybody comes and wants to have uh, higher salaries for its people. And, um, <clears throat> but it's not feasible uh, very often, unfortunately. We all want to give higher salaries, that's very easy. And HR also has there really some governance role in order to make sure that the system stays stable, for example. But more important is then also, if you really want to make a change in the organization, HR has to drive it also with training programs, with mentoring programs, with uh, nowadays the labor market changed completely. Whereas some 15 years ago, it, we could find people everywhere. Now, if you look for certain skills, it's very, very difficult and you have to have new models to attract people. 15 years ago, if you wanted to work, if you had the job at EO, it was great. It was a pension job. Yeah? So you could stay there until you, until you retire. You cannot attract young people, youngsters with new qualities and, and uh, uh, let's say a new drive with this kind of attitude. Yeah? So they, are not, they don't care whether they have a job at EO in 15 years. They want to have an interesting workplace they want to have an interesting work environment they want to have an environment where they can develop and really bring in their ideas and uh, that requires a lot of involvement from hr and also rethinking uh, within the hr world and uh, therefore hr is really one of the key functions uh, also for me in, in a company to drive a change and to drive an organization forward thank you so much frank thank you so much peter thank you so much markus um, unfortunately, like always, the time uh, we have to we have to also keep it into account. So we will close the panel for this point. Uh, unfortunately, also we are virtual and the entire audience is muted, so we cannot applause to you. I really, really want to say on behalf of all of us that it is uh, really great to hear to your insights and to your large experience. Thank you, thank you so much. And with this, I would like to give back to Sebastian.
So thank you also from my side. It was very great. Uh, it was uh, uh, a very interesting and great input uh, from everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, now we are coming to the part of uh, of questions. I already received uh, uh, some of them. Uh, however, I would like to emphasize once again, please uh, kindly write them uh, into the uh, into the chat if you have uh, further questions. Uh, please uh, address either uh, Dan uh, or Raluca or me, um, and uh, we will address them to the audience. Please also mention, let's say, <clears throat> uh, to whom you would like to have the question uh, addressed. Um, I see that also uh, some of the uh, questions I received have been already uh, answered uh, meanwhile. However, I uh, have here uh, one which is uh, very interesting. Um, which are the top competencies a leader should possess in order to succeed in an agile organization? And uh, this was addressed uh, initially to, to, to Ron and also uh, a similar question to Rike. Maybe uh, if you are still here, can you give us a short input on this one? What are the competencies uh, an agile uh, a leader should possess in an agile organization? Uh, to one of you. Ron, do you want to go ahead? Ron is uh, hello? muted. He's muted. Okay, then Rika, you take over. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Like these are the competencies you know um, an agile leader needs. Uh, it also depends on uh, the kind of culture and the environment you work in, right? That also forms the competencies. Um, but I think a couple of uh, them we we touched upon. I think um, what is kind of kind of important is, and it's not a competency, it's confidence. You know, the confidence you need to also, you know, be challenged and uh, the trust uh, you then need to give to the organization or to your people because um, agile leadership is basically a lot around trust because you give the autonomy, the freedom um, and the ownership to your people. So you need to have the confidence that they're doing right and the trust. And therefore, I think competencies like relationship building uh, are very important. Obviously, you need to have also a certain skill in the organization, and that depends then again on where do you actually where do you actually uh, work. I just see the pop up windows here, and uh, that's why I was a little bit irritated. Um, so I believe you know the questioning, the listening um, to the core to understand. Um, there are probably a lot more competencies you need, um, but it's hard to you know give you like a set of that. So I believe that a lot, of comp a lot of companies have defined their leadership competencies depending on the culture you want to really foster in the organization. I can obviously give you hours, but they will differ <laughs> to, um, to Heidi Chocolate and uh, to, uh, let's say, Aeon, for example. So you say it depends very much on the culture you would like to foster in an organization, on which uh, the leadership competencies you need in an organization especially uh, in an agile organization? I think that their core competencies you always need as, as a leader, right? Like we had some of them before, standing stand, um, you know, some of the core ones, and then the rest probably depends a bit on the surrounding and on the culture you, uh, you have, it's twofold. Ron, would you like to add to this? Like managing vision, for example, I can imagine managing vision and purpose if we speak about inspiring people and what we had before, right? It could be one of the competencies. Um, how do you bring people behind you? It has a lot to do also with like people agility, um, learning agility as such. Self-awareness is one of the competencies. If you're not self-aware, how can you develop other people? How can you, you know, see their uh, strengths and their weaknesses um, to help them, you know, um, make their career and make their, their way? But I'm happy for any builds on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I, I see Ron, but he cannot speak. But now I, well, now I can speak now. Thank you very much. I, I'm, so much has been said already, and, and I, I just cannot 
agree to every one of you and also to your latest uh, statement from Rike. Um, I think also the three key things of, of a, a leader in the HR, it's, it is the confidence, uh, yes, uh, the knowledge about culture, corporate, but also people knowledge and transfer this to your employee. And the most important thing is beside innovation, inspirational, motivational, and, and then it's trust. Once you build trust with your employee, they will follow you. But building trust is not easy. It needs time, it needs dedication. That's uh, my five cents. Absolutely, thank you so much. We yeah. received another great, what, what? May I add one point to this? To this question? Can yes, of course, Frank, move on, please. Yeah, okay, sorry, because I, I really have some experience with Asia team set up and um, uh, what it means for the organization. What it really means from my point of view, it was also mentioned by Rika and Baron, but it really means you have to, sell, to take yourself back. You know, you have a team, you have an agile team whom you, whom you really empower, uh, who has really got the task to deliver something, whatever it is, new product, let's say. And they come up with an idea and, uh, <clears throat> and yes, you have to, to, you have to be the servant leader who makes it possible for them to deliver, to give them the right environment, but you really have to take yourself back. And also you have to be very careful because if you're talking about cultural differences uh, in Eastern European countries, people very often really expect from the leader to take all the decisions. But agile leadership also means that you take yourself out. The team makes the decision, the team comes with proposals. You might see that the team from your point of view, I had this situation, runs into a wrong direction and I really had to take myself back uh, uh, and not to interfere, uh, to uh, um, and to 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 redo the decision uh, of the team. You really have to empower them, and it takes a lot of self-control and also sometimes uh, to um, to not uh, continue with the old leadership style where the manager says what needs to be done, and that's the right way. Go forward, go left and right. Uh, that's very interesting because we also received a very interesting uh, uh, question uh, uh, added to this and directed to you. Um, Marilena was asking about the hierarchical structure uh, of organizations in Romania. What actions did you take, undertake to change this uh, management style? And if today E.ON is still hierarchical uh, top down? Uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, also a kind of test. <laughs> So first of all, I'm no longer working for you, and so I cannot really say um, no. But uh, yes, for sure, it's still hierarchical. And also, I think you also have to distinguish. Not in every situation, each management style works. So let me give you again two examples. Uh, we had field organizations, which were, uh, uh, well, even still has field organizations, which are in charge of running a network, a gas network or an electricity network. So there is not the point of having agile teams and uh, uh, working around and discussing uh, about how, uh, how to do the work. There are clear work instructions, which are very, very safety re re relevant. If there is a mistake done on electricity, we kill our employees. If there is a mistake done on gas, we kill our customers. So it's not fun. So it needs to be very, very organ well organized, very disciplined according to work, work procedures. There is still room for empowerment of the people, because there's always room for improvement. Yeah? But the day-to-day -day work is very hierarchically organized in these teams, and I'm deeply convinced that this is the right way to do it. But if you look for innovation, uh, if you look for new products, if you look for new customer orientation or new customer uh, services, you need a different way of managing. And um, there, definitely, um, you have uh, a transformational uh, leadership is is a very, very great approach. And uh, agile, agile management is a very, very great approach. It does not always work. Yeah? And you also have to have the right people and skills for that. You can train people and you have to empower these people. Uh, empowerment it comes always from two sides also. One thing is the manager to give the empowerment. And the other thing is for the people to take the empowerment. Uh, what you will very, very often find, unfortunately, also, uh, and I think it's also a little bit typical for hierarchical countries, you may say, like Romania, um, that people are happy to call themselves director and have the plate at the door, but they're still not taking the management, the leadership. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and the same is then true for teams, of course. 
people who were used for many years to work in a, in a hierarchical organization and to receive orders, it takes time. And again, you have to foster it. You have to really uh, be the servant leader to make them work like this and to make it possible for them to work like this. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, there is place for different management styles in an organization, which is also sometimes very difficult to manage. Um, so, yeah. okay, sorry. I hope I answered the question. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> uh, very, very good. No, it was uh, very well answered. And uh, also the examples were uh, quite, uh, quite spot on. And of course, uh, working on the, uh, on empowering people. It's not happening from today to tomorrow. It, uh, it uh, demands a lot of encouragement and, and enforcement. I mean, you really have to uh, work on educating, let's say, uh, the, the, the management teams to take over um, responsibility for, for the decisions. I have another good uh, question here um, uh, and uh, uh, addressed to, to uh, Heidi Chocolate, Peter Miller. Uh, which is the main role of uh, management teams in driving engagement in organization? Uh, you uh, having had so much experience in, uh, in the Central Eastern European part, uh, what is there your, your answer to this, your feeling? Engagement is a key critical uh, um, thing you have to do in an organization. So, I mean, you need to give possibilities uh, formally and informally to engage um, with employees and with the teams. Um, in particular, I think the little, the little, the small engagement. So it's not, you know, you can, you, you make your big town halls and this kind of big meetings, and that's also important, but it's also the small engagement on a daily basis. I think the, the daily engagement is, 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 is key critical. And I think as a leader, you have also um, to, to encourage to cross fertilization, to think out of silos, to think across functions and to engage across. So it's not only the engagement of the management team uh, with, with the people, it's also the cross engagement and understanding what others are doing and understanding of different departments. And sometimes you have the situation um, uh, that there's a kind of tricky situation between departments because people might not understand what the others are doing. But when you're putting yourself in the shoe of others, yeah, then you have a different understanding of, 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 of the discussion. I think this is also what you can um, drive through engagement, not only top down, but also bottom up. I think it's very important to give these possibilities. Uh, we have, I, I think as many companies, open door policy. Yeah, uh, when, whenever people want to talk, they can talk. Um, they also, uh, I'm a believer on one to ones so also to give people the chance uh, on qualitative discussion, not necessarily only on performance or on business topics, but also um, when people want to get advice, personal advice, uh, that's important to be available. So uh, you have your principles and you communicate that, that it's very, very clear uh, what you're expecting. And what's also important, and it's building maybe what was said before, I have one saying that uh, I prefer early involvement than rather, appro rather late approval. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes also uh, people want to have the perfect solution, yeah, and they're coming very late with the, what they believe perfect solution, but it's just basically for sign off because they want to have an approval, rather engaging early enough that you co-create the solution. And I think this is what also was said by Rick, and so this is today, we are li living in a, in a flatter hierarchy, yeah, and co-creation and working as a team is where important. And one thing is for sure, the boss does not have always the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We have another interesting question actually directed to Dan. Uh, uh, Dan, also, also, you if have you allow me at this point, because I honestly believe that it is actually directed towards our, our panelists that uh, I have talked to before. But, but and, I know uh, you talk a lot about purpose and about uh, the social responsibility. Maybe you can give also your two cents to this. <laughs> that uh, well, purpose and social responsibility, I think, is uh, very demanding, especially in nowadays uh, for the new generation, especially Generation Y and Z. Uh, so maybe... You can well, the question is definitely a very, very interesting one. And it is a little bit different to what we have heard today because it actually, you know, involved on the one hand also 
the idea of young people that are entering the workspace. So this is one, one in particular topic. And on the other hand, we're also looking a little bit towards the topics of vision, the topic of corporate social responsibility, iron bent, iron bental and social impact features. So basically we talk a little bit about the ESG corporate social responsibility topic. And I really only want to share two or three ideas out of my head out of this because I would really like to also forward it to our panel. In the end, I think it is very strong here about purpose and about how do you want to actually gain young talents and what is important for them. And I mean, we know that uh, purpose in general is a very, very strong motivator and engages very much. And it is also definitely a desired goal for any leader. The question, however, is always, how do we actually generate purpose? And is corporate social responsibility a vehicle that can actually address it? I would also maybe like to highlight the idea that definitely it is one thing to make an yearly corporate social responsibility report versus indeed living it and being authentic about it and actually really having it as a purpose of a company. But so much to my thoughts, and I would really like to forward it also to our expert panel. What are your thoughts, thinking about young talent, thinking about purpose and on corporate social responsibility? Is this a topic for a leader? Is this a skill set? Is the competence? Is this important today? How is your view? Whoever speaks first. I will do screen sharing so that we can see each other better and larger if this is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ma Ma Marcos, I, I would like to, to, to give an answer down. I think C CSR is it's very, uh, very uh, high. It's a very high fashion today. All the companies are doing CSR reports and talking about sustainability that this, this is okay and this is certainly a right direction. <clears throat> but I think we have also to, 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 to make people aware that they have a certain effect of uh, our uh, CSR, of the company's CSR activities. And there I would see that one of the, the first and very important issues is the organizational health and safety issues. And this starts even with a very small company that you have working places <clears throat> that, you, that you organize, that, that you have an organization there where, can, where they can um, produce the goods and uh, weld or, or whatever, whatever is required. And that you, you show them that uh, it is important that they uh, have the, the the right personal equipment in order to protect themselves. And, and step by step, probably you bring it over that to, to the people you do not uh, do it for you. <coughs> you do not use a harness when you go up to three meters height, but you do it also for your family. And I made uh, uh, a very good experience with this that once there is the link to the family of the employees that they had understood at the beginning. They didn't understand why should we wear a hard hat? Why should we wear safety shoes? And once they have understood that this is also, it's not only for you, but for your family, then uh, things uh, have improved. And nowadays, I think most companies in, uh, in Romania, they, uh, they, they have the, the right direction and they have made a big change in the past 20 years. Markus, I would like to add this because we received a question from Mihaila uh, about um, uh, leadership changing process. Mm -hmm. um, how important is persuasion? How important is it to persuade others uh, or to, uh, uh, yeah, persuasion and leadership? Well, I, <coughs> I think this is, this is extremely important and I, I have prepared one, one of my, my closing message to the people. This is uh, to, to the leaders, I would tell, show personal commitment to whatever you are doing. Compassion and honesty, this is important. So you have to behave always in, in this direction, whatever you do, if you if you are in HR, if you are the general manager, if you produce something, if you sell some, something, the personal commitment and this is how i have understood this for me new uh, new new uh, area transformational leadership i i have always known leadership for this transformational leadership for me this is that you should be the role model and at the end i would also uh, 
tell everybody like what you are doing and show that you like what you are doing and then you bring people on board of the, of the same boat is it small or is, is it tall this does not matter so this is this is what i think you have to share with your people but you have to to show it and also there is very important that you are very open to feedback <clears throat> that you take the feedback and that you can 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 involve your employees in taking the decisions and that you understand different cultures thank you so much uh, one final question because we are running out of time um uh, to to uh, uh peter and probably also rike because it's about uh, culture uh also from mihaila uh how do we diagnose how do we start uh, uh changing culture how do we start changing culture? How, how do we diagnose and start changing uh the culture especially especially in eastern europe or for rike in also in western europe let's say you come into an organization and you see that there is a culture which uh, you do not uh, consider fruitful uh, what would be the steps uh, you would approach? Uh, I think first of all you need a bit of time because <laughs> you cannot change it uh, very very quickly but I think what you need to make clear is what what kind of behaviors do you want to see what are your values right and start start from the values and then you say okay you reward the behaviors which are really feeding into your values and you do not reward behaviors or are just not accepting behaviors you do not want to see. Mm -hmm. but then again, I also think uh, that I think the management obviously needs to role model that and needs to be, be behind it, but involve people in building a culture because you cannot just put a culture on top of people, but you need to, uh, you know, get the buy-in, involve people, maybe do uh, focus groups or, or groups from our, the organization who work together with you on building the culture so it comes from the top but you also pull it pull it up but i think it's a lot about rewarding the right and um, behaviors to influence a culture so basically you align on the values and then you reward behaviors which lead to these values uh, and you try to minimize uh, derailers okay would, it's all about you, if i may um if you start in a new role it's all about understanding and learning and listening. And I'm usually asking three questions. Uh, the first question is, what stage, in what stage you see the company? Yeah, I mean, you, you can be in a startup, you can be in a turnaround situation, you can be in a successful situation. So basically the four core stages, uh, what I'm asking. The second is, what are the values of the company or what are the behaviors in the organization where you're really proud of and which was also driving success in the, in, in, in the past. And then the third question is always, what makes you unhappy to come to office? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and with these three questions, uh, you can already build a little bit an understanding of where an organization is. And then uh, I think important is, you talk about vision, you talk about mission, uh, you talk about, uh, we talked before now about social responsibility and all these kinds of things. Important is that it's really a mindset and that it's really authentic and meant. Uh, when we talk about corporate social responsibility or sustainability, which is a big topic these days, it should be not just for PR reasons, there should be really, there has to be really the mindset in an organization uh, that you really drive it and that you mean it. And I think that's the beginning, that you really do it in an authentic way and not just doing things because it's now popular or it's on trend or we can use it for marketing purpose because then you will never establish the values and then you will not drive and change culture. So I think that's important. One of our values, for example, because it links to the Heidi story, everybody knows the little girl uh, and she tries, she makes everybody happy. She has made the grandfather happy and it's positivity. Yeah, and when you say one of your values is positivity, and then you need to see that when you are coming to our office, you need to see that, that people are smiling. Now you're not coming to the office, but you know you know what you mean. You really need to live it, you know, because then you establish and embed the values, and then it becomes a DNA in the organization. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, a, it's a great topic. Um, uh, thank you so much. I would also recommend that we directly use this uh, also for the next, uh, uh, whoever wants to stay and remain, of course, uh, to, that we discuss this in, uh, in individual groups. Uh, how do we 
um, how do we uh, define values? How do we uh, uh, create culture? How do we create, let's say, productive, collaborative uh, working culture? Uh, so uh, whoever would like to remain, uh, we would split in a small workout uh, uh, group session where we would kindly ask you to uh, shortly introduce each other uh, and uh, in order to get to know each other and then to discuss on the topic uh, uh, values and culture and how do we create a culture uh, which we need for the organization. Uh, but before this, because usually a lot of people are, uh, are um, um, uh, stop following, let's say. So the official part is over. Uh, we, will, uh, we will now stop also the recording. Um, and, uh, um, and I will also hand over to Anna to give some uh, final words, uh, let's say, to, to the next steps. And whoever would like to remain with us uh, is more than welcome to join in the breakout rooms in the so-called small uh, networking session. Thank you for this, Sebastian. And I also want to thank uh, all the speakers for the great insights. And I want uh, to thank all the participants for joining and for staying. And I want to thank uh, Stein and Partner for the great collaboration we had. And I just wanted to say that we, the VU Executive Club, has another event next week on mental health. So that's it from my side. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> OK, great. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, then I will uh, split now in these uh, breakout sessions and uh, uh, please also point uh, somebody who uh, remains uh, uh, here to shortly give us feedback about, uh, about this topic. Uh, how do we create culture? Uh, how do we define uh, values? Yes. Uh, and uh, please do not forget to shortly introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm going to leave you Sebastian. Thank you, Marcus. From now on, it's... Uh, Thank you. Thank uh, you. Very interesting. Bye-bye to everybody. Thank you so much, Marcus. All the best. Goodbye. Thank See you. you next time. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's stop. I have to stop recording. <laughs>